What's up guys, I got a brand new video for you today. Today we're looking at the brand new iPhone 10, and I would say that this is probably the most hyped iPhone that I've ever seen out of any iPhone. Apple sent it off to people that normally wouldn't get a phone to review. But yeah, it's time to get into my review. I've been shooting like crazy with this thing for an entire weekend, and uh, camera's pretty impressive. So let's roll the five second unboxing. All right, so getting into the specs, this phone has the new A11 Bionic chip. It's a 5.8 inch OLED Super Retina display. It's basically a, a quad HD display. It has a resolution of 2436 by 1125. Has a true tone display with P3 wide color gamut. Has 625 nits of brightness. This thing cranks out a ton of brightness. Outside, it's not a big issue. You know, compared to the 8 Plus, it's pretty similar. But I think what people are trying to compare it to is something like the Galaxy Note 8 or the Galaxy S8. And those phones are like way brighter than that. It has a glass back and that's for wireless charging. The phone is pretty heavy. It's got a stainless steel band around the entire outside edge. Obviously, there is no headphone jack. It has stereo speakers and the new massive notch on the top of the screen. So on the rear, we have two 12 megapixel cameras. One's a wide angle, 28 millimeter full frame equivalent, f1.8. And then the other one is a telephoto lens, which is 56 millimeters and it's f2.4, which is actually a little bit better than the iPhone 8 Plus, which is a 2.8 aperture. Then on the front, we have a seven megapixel f2.2 front facing camera. We have depth sensors and face tracking and face ID and a front facing camera can record 1080p video. All right, so the first thing I wanna talk about is face ID because obviously there is no home button on this phone and a lot of people are concerned about that. And I kind of was at first, but after using face ID, I found it to be no big deal. It works pretty much every single time. All right, so setting face ID up is really easy. Basically just put your face in the center of the circle and rotate your head around in a circle until it fills up green. When it likes it, it'll get you to do one more time just for more accuracy. And that's basically it. It's actually easier to set up than touch ID. Good to go. And you swipe up to enter the phone and that's it. The only time that it doesn't really work is if you have it laying flat on a desk and your face is off axis, you do have to angle it towards your face, but pretty much works every single time. Basically it has an IR dot projector. So it scans your face and it kind of figures out the 3D mapping of your face. And I found that sometimes even with one eye open, it'll still work. So if you close one eye, I'm in. So it's obviously choosing one of your eyes for like retina detection as well as your face. Now there's a lot of videos out there trying to fool face ID by wearing masks and stuff like that. But basically what Apple says is if you are growing in a beard over time as you're using it gradually, it'll start figuring out that you're growing a beard and it'll continue to work. But if you throw on like a fake beard, it's not gonna work. Now I also found that with some sunglasses it didn't work, so my Ray-Bans, they're not polarized, but it definitely will not work if my sunglasses are on. But I can quickly pop them up and pop them back down and it'll work. Now I've been seeing some people online using polarized sunglasses and it seems to work fine. So I guess it just kind of depends on the type of glasses you have. Now all that said, if you're worried about Face ID, you don't even have to use it. You can still use a regular passcode, but uh, it is way quicker to just look at your phone and it unlocks. So Face ID also works with Apple Pay now. So basically you just double tap the home button, it takes you to Apple Pay, you look at your phone, tap your phone, and you're good to go. Never tried it out, haven't set up Apple Pay yet, so I gotta try that out. All right, so getting into the gestures, once you've swiped up with Face ID, basically swiping down from the top right gets you to your control center. Swipe back up to get rid of it. Swipe down from the left or middle to see your notifications. Swipe up from the bottom and slowly arc over to the right to show your app switcher or your multitasking and you can click on any of the apps. You can also swipe between apps at the very bottom. And then to close them out, you basically just hold on them until they show a red icon. You can click them out like that, or you can swipe them up. All right, so the main part of this review that I wanna talk about is the camera. As you know, I talk a lot about photography stuff. I do talk about tech stuff, but camera stuff is my main area, and that's where I need to really focus on this thing. I went out, like I said, shot for a couple days. I was pretty impressed with what I got. There's a few things that are annoying between the telephoto and the wide angle lens, but uh, let's take a look at some samples.
So as you can tell, the image quality is pretty similar to something like an 8 Plus. I really don't find it that much better than the iPhone 7. I will say that the stabilized telephoto lens is really nice, especially for video. So this phone does record 4K 60 FPS. It also shoots up to 240 frames per second in 1080p, 120 frames per second in 1080p. And one thing that I've been wanting forever, which is 24 FPS in 4K. So now I can shoot in 24 FPS. I don't necessarily have to use Filmic Pro every time, but I really love 24 FPS. It's more cinematic and I just, I don't know, aesthetically, I like it better than 30 frames per second or even 60 frames per second playing back at 60 frames per second. But yeah, let's look at some video samples. facing camera on the iPhone 10. The front facing camera is 7 megapixels and can shoot 1080p video. It is extremely cold out here right now. I don't know why I'm here, but we gotta test this thing out. Hopefully the audio sounds good. We got wind, we got waves. Now I did shoot some stuff in RAW because obviously the phone is gonna be processing some noise reduction and stuff like that. And it always looks kind of waxy and mushy. So I wanna see what the grain structure looks like. So let's hop on the computer and take a look at some RAW shots that I took in low light. All right, so I have a few RAW images in here. Uh, I'm gonna open up a couple. I wanna do some of the low light stuff because I think that stuff kind of matters the most. So we're gonna open up one of these images. Now I've already played with the RAW settings. You can see the original image. Now you see no mushy stuff like you do with the JPEG because the JPEG, uh, the camera's processing all of the grain and kind of trying to smooth out the image. But look how much more sharp and how much more details in the shot when it's in RAW. So this was shot at f1.8, 1 40th of a second, ISO 400. So obviously on a cell phone, ISO 400 is a lot higher noise levels because the sensor's so tiny. But if we go back and apply my setting here, as you can see, we got a lot of color, a lot of detail. And if you posted this on something like Instagram, you wouldn't even hardly notice the noise because it would be something like this big. And that actually looks awesome. I don't hate the noise. If this was a DSLR and you're at like ISO 2000 or 3200, something like that, you might complain about the grain here. Open up one of these shots because I want to see what we can do with the highlights. You know, you can't go too far with this. You can go with the shadows. You actually can remove more shadow detail and you can highlight detail. This was at ISO 25, so we're not gonna have too much issues with noise. You can adjust your white balance, which is pretty cool. Pretty much make the shot look the way you want, but that looks pretty good. That probably looks better than the JPEG. There's actually quite a bit of detail in there. All right, let's take a look at one more low light image. This was outside of the Monroe Towers in Mississauga. Let me apply that setting I had. We are at ISO 320. If you pull the shadows out, you can obviously see tons of noise. That's pretty crazy that we're getting that kind of detail. Not necessarily detail, but like we're seeing what's in the shadows here when we pull those back a bit. Put the blacks back down. And again, I don't hate the noise. I'd rather see that than kind of a waxy fake shot. And this looks pretty decent. All right, so one of the big features that they brought with the iPhone 7 Plus, which they also have in the 8 Plus, is portrait mode. And they have portrait mode on this and portrait lighting. I did do a portrait mode video. That's gonna come out a little later. But uh, let's take a look at some portrait shots and kind of see what we got going on with the edges and the way that it's masking things out. Uh, I already snuck in some portrait shots in our sample images, but let's take a look at them and see what they look like. All right, I used portrait mode here just to kind of emphasize the foreground. 
And obviously on hard edges like this, it actually does a pretty good job. Like on this fire hydrant, it did a really good job around the hard edges. But if you look up at the very top here, it's a little soft. Now using it on an actual portrait, I was actually really impressed with how it masked out her hair. That's something that didn't work too well in the beta. And especially here, it looks really good. All right, going over the portrait lighting modes, there's contour light, stage light, stage light mono, and the stage lighting actually cuts you out of the shot, which is pretty crazy. So taking a shot here, you can see that it cut her out of the background. Uh, it's not perfect. I think it's in beta still, but it's kind of cool that it can actually do this. Contour light, studio light, natural light, and it's pretty cool that they're adding these features. So not only can you do portrait mode with the rear camera, you can actually do portrait mode with the front camera and all the different lighting setups. I wouldn't say it's quite as good as the rear camera, but you can do selfie portrait mode. So I'm pretty impressed with the portrait mode. It's definitely improved over the 7 Plus when I had the 7 Plus. And the funny thing is the only reason why I got the 7 Plus back last year was because I wanted to see portrait mode. And when I saw portrait mode, it really wasn't that good. I actually returned it and got the regular 7 just because I didn't like the size of it. I felt like it was a little too big. This to me is a perfect size. This phone is just slightly bigger than like a regular 8 or a regular 7 and slightly smaller than the 8 Plus. But there's a few things we got to talk about with the screen because obviously the notch is here and comparing it to the 8 Plus, you're actually getting less screen real estate when you're watching media. But if you're consuming content that's vertically like this, you actually have a little bit more room. So a lot of the reviews on YouTube right now, if you've been watching them, there's so many of them on this phone. They all seem kind of like cookie cutter and the same and like praising the phone. I do think the phone is a tank. It's built really nice, but there's a lot of stuff that we need to talk about that I don't like. First off, I wanna talk about gestures. Obviously the gestures have changed a lot. And I mean, I know why they did it. It's a software thing. There's no home button. They gotta figure out ways to get in and out of apps. That's fine, but the problem is I have a brand new iPad Pro, which still has the home button and uses the old gesture. So jumping between two devices is kind of annoying. It doesn't give you a seamless iOS experience because they should be the same, you know, like if you're using the same, it's not like Mac OS on a laptop is different from a Mac Pro. They're exactly the same, even though they're completely different devices. So that's kind of annoying. Uh, the big thing for me that I don't like is closing out an app, how you have to do that weird swipe and then click and hold. You click the little red icon to close it or you can flip it up. I don't know why they don't just have a way where you can just swipe them away like the old iPhone, why you have to click and hold them down. Kind of annoying. Doesn't seem intuitive at all. It seems kind of awkward. I actually had a really hard time getting into the app switcher until I figured out you kind of slide up and over. I was sliding up and it was just not working out too well. The next thing is the notch. I kind of am over it, but the problem is that the text isn't even aligned kind of in the pocket of where it kind of cuts out there. It's like lower. And to me, visually, it doesn't look nice. It kind of looks out of place and unfinished. It kind of looks like a beta, like they're like, oh crap, we didn't, uh, we need to bump it up higher or make the icon smaller. I think that if they made the icon smaller, it would fit properly. You don't see your battery percentage anymore until you slide down, which is annoying. You don't really know if you're connected to the carrier or not. And uh, it's just kind of weird. Um, I'm actually impressed with Face ID. It works really well. It doesn't work with my sunglasses, which is kind of annoying. If I'm in the car, I'm sitting in the car looking at my phone. That's where you're always gonna have sunglasses on usually. And you can't just look at your phone. You gotta lift your sunglasses up. It's pretty quick but it's still kind of annoying. Going back to the notch, uh, watching videos full screen, it's obviously gonna cut into your video, which is kind of annoying. And someone like me who films a lot of stuff, I don't want a chunk of my video missing. So you have to pinch it back in so it can run regular with borders on it, but then you're losing so much screen space. You've got black bars at the top, black bars at the bottom, and I really don't know what else they could have done unless they put a bigger chin at the top, which to me would maybe throw off the symmetry of it. But then again, there really is no symmetry if there's a notch here and not it down here. So technically they should have put a notch down here, but then you're missing even more screen real estate. So I, don't, I know there has to be a cutout there for the speaker and the camera. It just kind of sucks that it's so big. That's what we have to live with. Thanks, Apple. I'm kind of over it. It's not that big of a deal. I do think that it's kind of nice that we have something different to look at than the same iPhone screen for over the last 10 years. But I do think that having an OLED screen is really nice because they can actually black that off across the whole top. You don't even really notice it's there uh, because as you know, an OLED screen, anything that's black, 
turns off and there's no kind of illumination behind it. The viewing angles are pretty good. It does have a slight blue cast if you flip it on its side a little bit. Uh, it's not bad. It's not nearly as bad as something like the Google Pixel XL. And uh, viewing angles are pretty good. Brightness is good. People are kind of concerned about the brightness. I didn't find it an issue. The colors look good. They're not like overly saturated or overly contrasty. They're pretty flat. Uh, it's pretty similar to what any Apple phone looks like. But if you do compare it beside the iPhone 8 Plus, you can tell that this does have a little bit more contrast. And that's probably just because of the OLED screen. Okay, so we need to talk about this camera because Apple's doing some weird stuff with the telephoto lens. It kind of makes me mad because this is what was going on with the original 7. And a lot of the times, if you're in lower light environments, you're looking at something, you're filming something, you jump to the telephoto lens, all it's doing is a digital zoom on the wide lens because it's f1.8, lets more light in, less grain, and that's how Apple's kind of fooling you. But if you're in good light, you can definitely tell the difference between the telephoto lens and just a digital zoomed wide lens. That kind of annoys me. I also found out some issue that no one has talked about yet. If you're recording video in 4K 60 FPS or 1080p 240 frames per second, if you start off recording in the wide lens and try and jump to the telephoto lens, it won't do it. Now I don't really know why it's doing that. It kind of gives you a zoom rocker and all that's doing is digital zoom. If you stop record, then tap into the telephoto lens, then it starts working again. I figured out what was going on by covering up one of the lenses with my finger and realized the telephoto lens wasn't even getting used when I was zooming. Now it works fine in 4K 24 FPS and 30 FPS. I don't know what the difference is, why they couldn't add that in for 60 FPS or even the other slow motion modes, but for some reason, that's what's going on. All right guys, these are my final thoughts. All in all, the phone's built amazing. It's one of the nicest looking iPhones I think they've ever created. Some of you might not like the notch. It's not for everyone, but you know, I don't mind it now. I think it's kind of something unique to look at. It's a little different. I've gotten over the home button. Don't care if there's a home button ever again. The slide up to unlock is fine. Um, sliding out of an app is fine. You just slide up and you're out of it. It's not a big deal. A lot of people are like, oh, but it's not a hardware button. Well, technically the button that is on the iPhone 7 and 8 isn't a hardware button anymore anyway. It's just a touch capacitive button. Would have been nice if they could put something like that in the screen. I do prefer having a touch ID, like say you just want to quickly look at your phone and like inconspicuously, so you're in your pocket, you have your finger on touch ID, you just pull it out of your pocket and you can see it. With this, you literally got to raise it and look at it and then put it back in your pocket. Kind of annoying. But Face ID does work pretty flawlessly most of the time. Every time, uh, I'm actually surprised sometimes when I'm not even thinking, it just unlocks automatically. You can swipe it up before it even shows the unlock thing. So basically just turn it on, swipe up, and it's unlocked. So you don't really have to wait for the unlock thing if you're thinking it's kind of slow. It's actually pretty quick. It doesn't seem to be any slower than Touch ID, but I do find that it's not nearly as accurate as Touch ID, so. The stereo speakers are awesome. They're nice and loud. They sound amazing. I would say they're slightly better than the iPhone 7 Plus, which was also pretty loud. And to me, it's one of the best sounding speakers in a smartphone. I also forgot to mention that this does have wireless charging and I bought a cheap wireless charge pad off Amazon and it works pretty well. It took about an hour and a half to two hours to charge it to full from 20%, so it's not insanely fast. I have the 12 watt uh, iPad adapter plugged into it. Put a link in the description where I got my little pad. I think it was like 20 bucks Canadian. So it's pretty cheap. It's cheaper than the wireless charge pads that they have on their site and it has a nice rubber grip so your phone's not gonna slide around. I'm happy with the camera, the 4K quality, Low light's not too bad. I mean, it is an iPhone. It's got a tiny little sensor, but uh, the images look pretty good coming out of it. Portrait mode has been improved. Again, I'm coming out with a portrait mode video in a couple days so you can take a better look at it. Super impressed with the phone. It cost way too much money. I only got the 64 gig because I don't think that the 256 gig is worth it. We got the new Kodak, the HVEC, and it makes the file sizes quite a bit smaller, but with the same quality as H.264. Yeah, if you're worried about getting 64 gigs and it's not gonna be enough for you, I wouldn't worry about it. I would just go for it. I think that, you know, you've got plenty of space of 64 gigs. Back two or three years ago, we would have been stoked to have 64 gigs. So don't worry about it. If you're worried about not having enough space, I mean, some people are hardcore and never delete anything, then maybe you should probably get the 256 gigs. But if you got Apple Music, you don't have to save anything on here. Uh, build quality feels similar to something like the iPhone 4. So if you remember how solid the iPhone 4 was, this thing feels just as solid. Uh, there's no aluminum. It's definitely thicker and heavier than any other iPhone that I've used in a while, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. I'm okay with this. It's not like it's massively thicker. And the battery life is, you know, you get a day out of it. It's not anything insane. Anyway, if you like this video, give it a thumbs up. If you dislike this video, give it a thumbs down twice. I'll see you in the next one. Well, I guess you guys made it to the end of the video. 
And I didn't even talk about Animoji, so here you go. You get to look at Monkey Boy. Ah!